Hey folks, what is the worst experience that you have ever had with ants? Yes, I'm talking about those little things that crawl all over the ground. Uh, some of you may have had an experience at a picnic or something where the ants just drove you crazy. Or maybe there's been a time when you've been uh, out uh, in a field or sitting around or doing some work and you got into some red ants and uh, you haven't forgotten that one just yet. So uh, as you think about an experience that you've had with ants, let me ask you this. Can you think of anything good about ants. Now, some people have, uh, around our area, you wind up getting them in your house as little tiny uh, ants, and it seems like there's no way that you can get rid of them. And uh, for the most part, most people say, I can't think of anything healthy or good about an ant. Uh, well, at, let me ask you this. Why do you think that God even created ants? Well, hang on. We're going to be looking at some passages in just a moment out of Proverbs chapter 6, and we're going to learn some life lessons from an ant. Grab your Bible and come on back and join us. Hey folks, welcome to the Wednesday Bible Study of Central Baptist Church of Oak Ridge, North Carolina. Hope and trust and pray that uh, your day and uh, your week are going well. We're going to be looking at passages out of Proverbs chapter 6, uh, particularly verses 6 through 19, uh, where we can learn some life lessons from an ant. A moment ago, I asked you, uh, you know, if you could think of anything good about an ant. Well, hopefully I can change your, your, your heart or your philosophy a little bit as we look uh, at these particular passages of Proverbs uh, 6, verses 6 through 19. And uh, let's go ahead and, uh, and begin reading our scripture text for today. Proverbs chapter 6, beginning with verse 6. It says, Go to the ant, you sluggard. Consider her ways and be wise. Uh, which, having no captain, overseer, or ruler, provides her supplies in the summer and gathers her food in the harvest. How long will you slumber, O sluggard? When will you rise from your sleep? A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to sleep. So shall your poverty come on you like a prowler and your need like an armed man. Verse, verse 12, a worthless person, a wicked man, walks with a perverse mouth. He winks with his eyes. He shuffles his feet. He points with his finger. Perversely, uh, perversity is in his heart. Uh, he devises evil continually. He sows discord. Therefore, his calamity shall come suddenly. Suddenly, he shall be broken without remedy. These six things the Lord hates. Yes, seven are an abomination to him. A proud look, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked plans, feet that are swift in running to evil, a false witness who speaks lies, and one who sows discord among the brethren. Let's look to the Lord in a word of prayer. Father, as we come to you now, we pray that you will truly help us to, uh, Lord, learn some, some life lessons uh, from the ant. Lord, I pray that you will uh, help us to concentrate on what the Spirit would have to, to say to each and every one of us today on an individual basis. Lord, may we truly be drawn close to you, uh, and may all that we say and do magnify you. Today, Father, help us as we lift you up uh, to draw all men unto you. And Lord, have your will and way in each and every heart and each and every life. And Lord, may this message, may your word truly not fall on deaf ears today, as we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, folks, today you know, in our text, the writer shares some very important life lessons that we can learn from the ant. Now, one of the things that we see is uh, in, in verse 6, notice what it says in chapter 6, verse 6 of our text. It says, go to the ant, you sluggard, right? Consider her ways and be wise. Now, what is a sluggard? And what do uh, you know? And, and what is a sluggard instructed to do in verse six? Let's go look at it one more time. Verse six says, uh, "Go to the ant, you sluggard. Consider her ways and be wise." In other words, uh, what it's talking about, and we know what a sluggard is. A sluggard is somebody who is uh, you know, slow to move, slow to react. Uh, somebody that you that, that really needs to have some motivation to get going to do almost anything. Uh, yeah, and I'm not talking about just. 
important things. I'm talking about just anything. Somebody who is lazy. When we consider that term, lazy is, is probably uh, w- would be a, a word that we could fit right in there. So, you know, what when you think about what a sluggard is, that's somebody that's lazy. And in the scripture, it tells us, it says, go to the ant and consider her ways. Now, why would we do that? You know, what, what are we going to see, you know, from an ant? Now, some of us, as we talk about these things, you're going to understand uh, a little bit more in, in, insight into what this is actually talking about. So, well, what insightful observations does our writer make about the ant? As we read in verses 7 and 8. Look with me at verses 7 and 8. It says, when it's talking about the ant, it says, uh, which uh, having no captain, overseer, or ruler provides uh, her supplies in the summer and gathers her food in the harvest. Now, all of us have taken the time to look at an ant, and you have watched uh, that ant pick up uh, a big piece of maybe something from your picnic basket, or maybe there was something that was laying around in the ground. Maybe you've seen where somebody has spilled something, and, and what happens is these ants are just making this continual run back and forth, and you're seeing them carrying these pieces of food back to their nest, back to a place where they can store up for when there is no food, when the winter time comes and there's nothing that they can find around. But what you see is you see them working. You actually see them you know, showing you a tremendous amount of strength. When Sometimes when you look, they're carrying a piece of food that's as big as they are. Uh, but yet what happens is you see them just continually going. They're busy, 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 uh, just one right after the other, picking up those food particulate and taking them back uh, to the nest. So there's certain things that we can see about them in verses 7 and 8, and it says this. It says that as it goes and it gets that food, it provides her supply in the summer. So there's plenty of food there when it's, when it's around and when it's prevalent, and gathers her food in, in the harvest. Okay, then, so we're talking about how the ant actually stops and, and, and not only has enough sustenance for the time being, but also plans for the future. Now, you can see, at least at this point, I hope you can, where there are some valuable lessons that we can truly learn from the ant in our day and age. You know, we can see some pretty insightful things as to what they do, even though most of the time when we're looking at them, we're looking at the the nuisance that they are to us. They're looking at the fact that particularly those red ants, they'll bite you and it hurts. Uh, you know, we see where uh, yeah, the ants can ruin the picnic or they can uh, all of a sudden be in your kitchen uh, in some place that you don't want them to be uh, getting on that cake that you left on the counter or something else that you may have left there and it just drives you insane. Now, when we think about these observations, what do these observations teach us? about the the ant's work ethic. You know, work ethic is a big thing. I mean, most of the people that you talk to today will say, well, the work ethic of uh, the modern American today is not like it used to be. There's just no work ethic at all. Now, I won't want to say that there's no work ethic at all, but it's a whole lot different than it used to be. I mean, you know, we we look at things, look at how even the times have changed. You know, there was a time when people, you know, worked from seven in the morning until three in the afternoon. Then there were times that there was, uh, you know, eight to five, and then it was nine to five. And uh, I've often sat back and thought when I went to to high school, you had to be, you know, in your homeroom class at at five minutes till eight, and the first class started at, that bell rang for the first class at eight o'clock. Uh, and then we got out at 3.30. Now I see a lot of schools that they don't even have to be there till 10, 10.30. Uh, it's just you know, pushing that sleep and slumber a little further uh, uh, down the road. So again, I'm not necessarily throwing off on those things, but when you stop and think about it, the work ethic has changed. You remember the times when you know you tried to do whatever that you could and whatever you needed to do to, uh, to, to please uh, your customers? Remember the old adage, the customer is always right? Well, in today's society, it doesn't seem like the customer is ever right, and it doesn't seem like anyone cares about it. So what you can see is you can see that the work, work ethic in our society has gone tremendously downhill from what it used to be, okay? Uh, you know, so what does, what does the, us looking at the ant, what does it teach us about the ant's saving plan? You know, do, do they have anything set back for a rainy day? Absolutely they do. They put up so that they're going to have plenty of food when uh, the times get tough, when uh, when it gets to the point where there's uh, no longer uh, an, an opportunity for, for them to go out and to gather. Now, what kind of a savings plan do you have? What, what have you got? 
not set aside for a rainy day? What have you got uh, as an emergency fund as we you know, talk about it here? Are you just simply living day to day, paycheck to paycheck? Folks, that's not a good way to live. That is not wise stewardship. You need to have a plan for when those times come uh, when there's no sustenance to be found. You need to have that savings plan. So as you can see, there's plenty that we can learn from the ant. Now, you know, as an example for us to follow, as, as I've told you before, look for examples to follow as we go through the Lord's Word. So as an example to follow, how might we apply these lessons that we're learning from the ant to our daily lives? I gave you some hints on that just a few moments ago. You know, what, would, would somebody consider you a sluggard? Would you consider yourself a sluggard? Now, oftentimes people would say, well, I'm not a sluggard. But those that know them very well would have a varying opinion. So the first thing you have to do is be honest with yourself about where you are. Have you made plans? Are you a good steward of the things that God has entrusted you with? Um, you know, are, are you doing what, what would be pleasing to God and what would honor Him? And are you doing uh, what is necessary to look out uh, for yourself and your family during the times that, that, that might be uh, pretty tough that lie ahead of you? you know, do, do you think that the ant is wiser than some people? Yeah. Now, when you when you think about it, a lot of people would sit back and say, "Well, yeah, they are because they actually have a savings plan. They actually, you know, look out for the, the time that they're uh, they're spending right now. But not only then, they also know winter is coming. They also know that there are some tough times that are going to be coming. So they they store up for those tough times. So you know, in a lot of ways, we see people who don't do that. You know, they're just they're they're always reliant upon somebody else to get them through when the tough times start. Or when the tough times happen. And you know, some people are just, they just can't get the picture. They just don't get it. They just don't understand. They've been there time and time again where they've had to be bailed out by somebody and yet they haven't learned their lesson. You know, I would say look to the ant. Take some lessons from the ant today on preparation for not only the here and now, but for when the times uh, get tough. Now, in response to the ant, you know, what questions does the writer ask the sluggard? Remember the lazy person. So what is the writer of Proverbs asking the sluggard? Look with me at verse 9. Verse 9 says, How long will you slumber, O sluggard? When will you rise from your sleep? You know, so the question is, how long are you going to, to stay with those ways? You know, what is the, the circumstance? What is the situation that's holding you there? You see, even you don't like it. So what is it that's keeping you in that, that, that lazy, sluggard type of position? Well, uh, there are some warnings that the writer gives to the lazy person or sluggard who just loves to sleep and loves to slumber in verses 10 and 11. Look with me at verses 10 and 11. It says, a little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to sleep. So shall your poverty come on you like a prowler and your need like an armed man. So what happens, and notice what that's saying right there. Yeah, most of the, the people who are lazy and are sluggards, they're not worried about what's going to happen. It is going to come. Notice what it says. It's going to come on you like a prowler. It's sneaking up on you. You're not even knowing when it's going to happen. Those hard, lean times are going to come when you least expect it. The question is, are you pre-prepared for those times as they come? Now, the Lord says a whole lot about laziness, okay? So I, I want to give us, you know, some some context of that out of some other uh, some other books that we have. Look with me if you would. Well, you don't have to turn there. I'm just going to take you there. But but Proverbs uh, several passages. Proverbs ten five. Proverbs 19, 15, Proverbs 20, 13, and then Proverbs uh, 24, 30 through 34. But I'll read them for you. So Proverbs 10, 5 uh, actually reads like this. Uh, Proverbs 10, 5 says, He who gathers in summer is a wise son. He who sleeps in harvest is a son who causes shame. That means when the harvest is out there, that means when it's readily available that, that it could be gotten and it could be stored up and it could be saved up, it doesn't happen. Listen to it again. He who gathers in summer is a wise son. He who sleeps in the harvest is a son who causes shame. Okay? What about another one of those verses that comes out of Proverbs? What about Proverbs uh, chapter 20, uh, verse 13, that says, Do not love sleep 
lest you come to poverty. Open your eyes and you will be satisfied with bread. Are you, are you seeing how that's going? Are you seeing what the Lord is saying there? Okay, what about the next one? What about uh, uh, Proverbs 19.15? Proverbs 19.15 says, Laziness casts one into deep sleep, and an idle person will suffer hunger. Once again, being warned of what's taking place. Once again, being warned of laziness. The Lord, folks, does not condone laziness. Now, over in uh, Proverbs uh, chapter uh, 24, verses 30 through 34, it says this. It says, I went, by my, I went by the field of a lazy man and by the vineyard of, of the man devoid of understanding. And, and there it was, all overgrown with thorns. Its surface was covered with nettles. Its stone wall was broken down. When I saw it, I considered it well. I looked on it and received instruction. A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest. So shall your poverty come like a prowler and your need like an armed man. Does that sound familiar? That sounds a whole lot like what we just read in our text over in, in Proverbs uh, chapter 6. Once again, we see all kinds of scripture that, that talk about the fact that we are not to, and nor does the Lord, uh, condone laziness. He just doesn't do it. So the question is, are you a lazy person? Now, before you answer that question, you, you, there's this old expression that says, to thine own self be true. You have got to be honest with yourself about where you are. I mean, if you can't honestly sit back and say, well, you know what? Yeah, I, I am a lazy person. Then you're never going to get out of it. Maybe you can look at yourself today and say, you know, I've been slothful. I've been lazy. And yeah, I need to break that. Well, then these scriptures can help us uh, in doing so. But you've got to be honest with where you are. Now, I'm not saying that everybody is. I know all of us could probably do better in some areas of our lives. And I'm not saying that everybody is that just pure, lazy, slothful person that nobody wants to be around and, and doesn't get anything done. But yet there are some people who are out there like that. I guarantee you that when I said that, you guys thought of somebody in your heart of hearts. Okay? You just did. Yeah. Uh, how, how do these verses that we just read uh, relate to the writer's warning about laziness that we're looking at uh, over here in chapter 6. Every last one of them uh, you know, condemns laziness, okay? And that's what the Lord is saying to you and I as well. It's time for us to, uh, as, uh, as the old church people say, uh, stop uh, sitting on our, our uh, we'll see what, how does it say, uh, we're, we're too busy uh, sitting on our, our blessed assurance when we're talking and we're singing about standing on the promises and we're too busy sitting on the premises. It's time to get up. It's time to get busy. It's time to stop being lazy and allowing somebody else to do what God has called us to do. Okay? So what does the writer say about the mouth, the eyes, the feet, and the fingers uh, of, a, of a worthless person or a villain in, chap in verses 12 and 13 of our text? It says this. It says, A worthless person, a wicked man, walks with a perverse mouth. He winks with his eyes. He shuffles his feet. He points with his fingers. Okay? So it, it, it's talking about those things that, that, that he does. Okay? Uh, what, what do these things primarily imply? It's usually blaming somebody else. It's usually you know, saying that it was somebody else's fault. It's not taking ownership for the things that, uh, that we are supposed to do. Listen, we will always blame somebody else for something that we should have, uh, should have done. You know, at what point do we stand up and say, look, that was my bad. I should have done that. I don't want to be in this situation again. I will take care of making sure that it gets done. Let me ask you this question. Can you be taken for your word? When, when you tell somebody, I am going to do something, do they uh, count on you and look at you as a person who is reliable? Or have you repeatedly let that person down and not done what you told them that you would do? How do you think they feel about it? I mean, are you considered dependable? Uh, there are people in my life I know that if they tell me they're going to do something, I don't depend on it being done. I make sure that there's checks and balances in place. There are other people in my life who when they say it's going to be done, I have no doubt that it's going to be taken care of. And the reason why is because they're going to honor their word. They're not going to be lazy in, in doing it. And they still believe that a person's integrity, their word is part of their integrity. Okay? Where, where do you fit on that scale? 
Okay? What, what, does it, what, what does the Scripture say about a worthless person's heart? Let's look in verse 14. Verse 14 tells us uh, perversity is in the heart, is in his heart. He devises evil continually and he sows discord. Folks, I, I've said this a thousand times around here. I will say it again on this broadcast. The Lord has a, a, a distaste in his mouth for those who uh, orchestrate or manipulate the demise of others. And that is often what happens when we look at the heart of a lazy or a worthless person. Let's look at it again. Verse 14. It says, perversity is in his heart. He devises evil continually and he sows discord. I mean, all of us probably know somebody in our life that what they do is they're pot stirrers. They want to go out there and they, they may take something, they may take it completely out of context, but they're going to run and they're going to try to stir up something between you and somebody else. And, and they just live to see that happens. You know, that's, that, that's talking about a, a, a worthless person and what their heart is like, okay? Uh, it also says that, that this type of a person is one who sows discord and, and stirs things up. He's out there to stir the pot. He doesn't like peace, and he doesn't want to be at the flashpoint of it. It's always a whispering campaign. Well, did you hear about what Pastor Roy said, or did you hear about what so-and-so said? And they'll say it to the person that's going to take offense at it, even, yeah, even if it wasn't true and then they get mad at me or somebody else and, and oftentimes they will never come to you to find anything about it. What they'll do is they'll start the whispering campaign around when every bit of it was based on something that was untrue. Did you see how they stirred the pot to stir up trouble? Let me ask you this question. Has the Holy Spirit convicted your heart today that that might be you? If it is, listen, today is the day to repent. Today is the day to begin to sow the good seed that you may harvest the good harvest down the road. Okay, listen, that's not up to me. It's up to what the Holy Spirit has spoken into your heart about where you are when it comes down to this particular message and these particular points. But you see, in verse 15, he also uh, gives a warning to this type of a person. And if that's you, you want to pay careful attention. Verse 15 says this, Therefore, his calamity shall come suddenly. Suddenly, he shall be broken without remedy. It's going to happen. The Lord is going to take care of it. The Lord is going to uh, see to it that that doesn't continue on. You know, do you want the wrath of the Lord to fall on you? If that is you, then I beg you today, repent. Repent means that you found you're going in, in a way that is errant and you have turned into the right path. You begin to sow those good seeds. And where there, there's repentance, there is forgiveness. Okay? Now, as we continue on in our text in verses 16 through 20, there's a list of seven things that it says that the Lord hates. Okay, look with me, verses 16 through 20, and let's see what these seven things are. All right, verses 16, it says, these, uh, it says, these six things the Lord hates. Yes, seven are an abomination to him. A proud look, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked plans, feet that are swift to run to evil, a false witness who speaks lies, and one who sows discord among the brethren. There's seven of those. And notice what it says. And it says, and, and one of these is an abomination. Which one was that? The last one. Which one is that? One who sows discord among the brethren. Folks, let me tell you something. If you go out to stir that pot amidst the brethren in your church, then you better be careful because that is something that, that the Scriptures tell us that God hates. You know, whether it's right, wrong, indifferent, or otherwise, do not become a party to that. This is something that God hates. Remember what I said before. There is a dastardly distaste in the mouth of God Almighty for anyone who manipulates or orchestrates the demise of somebody else, who creates discord within the church. And folks, let me tell you, the Word tells us that that, that person is going to pay for the things that they are doing when it comes to sowing discord uh, among the brethren. Do not be that person. If that is you, then I beg you today, repent. 
Turn from those ways today and seek the Lord and begin to sow those good seeds. Remember what it says, of these things, there's one of them that's most offensive. Now, it probably of these seven things, there's one of those that's most offensive to you. And, and, and you can think of the reasons why. Maybe you have been a victim of somebody you know, doing these things to you. And man, I'll tell you one thing, it just makes you have a, a, just a, a bitter taste in your mouth over those circumstances and situations. Now, let me ask you that. As you thought about maybe being a victim of one of these, which one of these things have you struggled the most with in your past? Which one of these things has it, has it been tough for you to overcome or that the Lord's had to convict you and you've been like, ah, oh, that's not good. This is one of those things that's going to cause uh, trouble. It's going to cause discord. And I have to be very careful about it. Some of us found out after we had done it uh, and, and had to repent from us. There have been times when uh, you've been in the middle of it and the Holy Spirit's convicted your heart and you had to change your way. And some of you, it, it, right before you were getting ready to do it, you listened to the Holy Spirit's conviction and didn't do it. And that's great. Uh, but we've got to be in tune with the Holy Spirit uh, to be able to overcome these things, okay? Now, you know, how has your personal relationship with Christ made a difference in your life in relation to the seven things that the Lord hates? Now, let me ask that again. How has your personal relationship with Christ, your one-on-one, -on -one, made a difference in your life in relation to the seven things that the Word tells us in our text that the Lord hates. You know what? You're not going to overcome uh, these things. You're not even going to know what they are unless you have that walk with the Lord. The closer that you walk with Him, the more you hear Him. Remember what I said a moment ago. I kind of gave you that sliding scale. You know, wouldn't you rather be convicted of something uh, as before and hear the Lord telling you before you do it, before you make that sin, that the Lord says, don't do it, and you don't. You know, sometimes we're just we're, we're just so amped up and the adrenaline's going that we're in the middle of it before we hear the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's saying, don't stop, stop. You're, you're creating harm. And then there's times that we've already done the damage and the Lord says, look, now that you're coming down off of your high horse, you just did, you know, one or several of the seven things that I really, really hate. Man, how does that make you feel? Okay. Now let me ask you this. How has our Wednesday Bible studies helped you to grow out of laziness in regard to reading and studying the Lord's Word? I hope and trust and pray that it's done a, a great, uh, uh, done you a great service. Okay. Today what we need to do is pray that we will have the work ethic of the ant and a spiritual heart that beats for the things that God loves. Okay. Let me go ahead and give you what our Bible readings for next week, week are and then we'll close out in prayer. Actually this week, this week, our Bible readings will be Proverbs chapter 7 through Proverbs chapter 9. Once again, that's Proverbs chapter 7 through Proverbs chapter 9. And next week, we will look at uh, the warning against adultery from Proverbs chapter 7, verses 1 through 27. Let's look to the Lord in a word of prayer. Father, as we come to you now, we just pray that you will help us to learn lessons from the ant, that our work ethic, uh, not only for you, but in all that we would do, would be reflective of the ant as they uh, as they, they take care of the, the current needs, but Lord, they also uh, work on having a supply to go forward. Lord, help us to have a spiritual heart that beats for the things that you love more so than anything. So Lord, help us as we pray for our brethren. Help us, Father, to represent you well and give us a great great week for these things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey folks, thank you for joining us. God bless you. I hope that you have a great rest of your week. If you have the opportunity, come join us this Sunday. If you're in the area, Central Baptist Church, Oak Ridge, North Carolina. Address is 1715 Highway 68 North. We're right across from the Oak Ridge Military Academy. We would love to have you come worship with us in spirit and in truth. So God bless you. Have a great rest of your week.